Again, this is Rich Wetherill, Program Manager for Climate Watch. Welcome to part three of uh, Climate Watch for University Students. As explained in part two, Climate Watch is a program where you can get involved by recording on indicator species. There's two ways to approach this, accessing the Climate Watch website through climatewatch.org.au and with our iPhone and Android apps. Climate Watch is based on indicator species and these species are broken up into different groups. So there's birds, jellies, reptiles, frogs, mammals, spiders, insects, plants, whales and even marine algae. Not all plants and animals are appropriate for monitoring with something like Climate Watch. We're looking at the monitoring the phenology of a large range of species but getting a large range of people involved in the data collection. So based on international experience for programs like Nature's Calendar that have been very successful in the UK, we have developed a set of selection criteria that have determined which indicator species are included in Climate Watch, which are the plants and animals that we want you to record on. So here we have the essential selection criteria. We need the species to be common and easy to identify. That way a large number of people can record on them. They need to have a seasonal event, so their breeding needs to be tied to a particular time of year, driven by temperature or rainfall. We need an observer network, so plants and animals have been selected that can be found in areas with large populations. And most importantly, because you're not being supervised or there isn't any equipment required, we want these plants and animals to be safe. So you don't have to get into dangerous locations, but you're also not trying to record on dangerous species like snakes. Some of the optional selection criteria include plants and animals that are iconic. For example, the Australian magpie. We've also included international species because data has been collected around the globe on the phenology of plants and many of these plants are actually planted in urban environments in Australia. Similar to there being an observer network, we've gone for species with a broad distribution so we can compare at different latitudes what is happening. Species with historical data have been selected. so. Many of the birds have been prioritised based on the historical data that could be found for them. If there's links with other indicators, for example bees, uh, common pollinators, and that leads into the next one, so if they have a role in a process like pollination. If there are indigenous links, for example the Nutsia floribunda, the WA Christmas tree, is a species that is special to Noongar groups in the southwest of Australia. Also, if there are links to current research, so species like the welcome swallow are currently being researched looking at historic data, and if they're representative of a regional ecosystem. So all of these factors came into play when selecting the indicator species for Climate Watch. I'll give you a couple of examples to further highlight this. So the welcome swallow is an example of a bird that's a really good fit. There is a lot of historic data. There's links to existing research. It's common and easy to identify. It's got a very distinct forked pattern with its tail and can be seen hawking around lakes and grassed areas and commonly found nesting around buildings. On the right hand side there we have the London plane tree. So this is an international species but it is commonly planted in urban environments especially in cities like Melbourne and Perth. It's a common street tree. It's very robust because the bark it has sheds uh, as it picks up pollution so it can last in environments with plenty of traffic but it's got distinct seasonal events as well such as losing its leaves and fruiting and flowering and of course it is linked to international data collection. This is an example of a species that's not a good fit. So the noisy miner, it might be common and easy to identify but it's a very opportunistic breeder. So if it's got enough food and water it can be found breeding. So it hasn't really got a seasonal signal. So when it comes to making an observation for Climate Watch, we essentially want you to answer four questions. What is it? So which Climate Watch species have you seen? Where was it? So you can mark the location on a Google map using the web interface or grab the location uh, automatically with the iPhone or Android app. When was it there? So the date and time of the observation is crucial. 
and how is it behaving. So for example, with birds, we want to know when birds are nesting or when they're feeding their young. For plants, we're particularly interested in events like flowering, and in some case for international species and some deciduous plants when they lose their leaves. And in some cases, you may not be able to see the species in question. So for frogs, not always easy to find and see, but when you can hear the males calling, that's a really good indicator for their breeding time. So that's a crucial observation. Similar with some birds, such as cuckoos, you might not be able to see them, but when you can hear them calling, we know that they are in your area. And for migrants, that's really, really helpful. If you were going to record on a climate watch trail, this shows you how to do it. We've developed a really simple shorthand method that uh, can be used on any sort of map. So you can download recording sheets for any climate watch trail and explore and record those, uh, your observations on those. But if you uh, just have a, a map that you've got from say Google Maps, you can use that as well. And so the four crucial things to mark on your map are where you find your observation is the species. And so you can use an abbreviated code such as RB for rainbow bee eater or SB for slender bankshire. How many? So is there one, two, three of those species? What was it doing? So in the example we have here, there's a rainbow bee eater. There was one of them and it was calling. And in this next example, there was a slender bankshire. There was one of them and it was the end of flowering. So two observations very quickly marked on the map. I'll now explain how these seasonal observations fit together. So for example, with flowering, there's a couple of crucial events that are based on standards used internationally. You have the first fully open flower, so it's a very distinct event. Next, there is full flowering. So this is considered when there are more than 50% of the flowers open. Not all flowers open at exactly the same time, but when you've got more than half of the buds open as flowers, that plant is considered to be full flowering. Finally, at the end of the season, when all the flowers are dried up, you've got 95% of the flowers dried out, it is the end of flowering. So this is the seasonal event. With a change in temperature, we're likely to see earlier flowering. So first flowering happens earlier than it has in the past, full flowering happens earlier, and the end of flowering happens earlier. So you see there's a shift in that seasonal event, it happens earlier. How can this data be used? Well, this is an example with the Australian magpie. So it's a common, easy to identify species and one of the most popular species to record on Climate Watch. The data in the graph on the right hand side shows historic data. So this has been collected through the Nest Record Scheme and Bird Atlas programs from BirdLife Australia. Here, this data has been collected by volunteers and what they found by looking at where the birds were nesting is that as you move to higher altitudes, the day of the year that the bird is nesting becomes later. So there's a link there between temperature. So at cooler temperatures, the birds are nesting later. So that means with a change in temperature, with increasing temperatures, magpies are likely to nest earlier. There's also some more complex effects and long-term uh, impacts such as the southern oscillation effect southern oscillation index affecting the amount of breeding but the first sort of order trend there is that with increasing temperature we'll see magpies nesting earlier. Similarly with the common brown butterfly this is commonly found on the east coast researchers have found that the butterfly is now coming out about 10 days earlier than it was 60 years ago so that's a shift in that seasonal event the butterflies emerge around spring and they're emerging 10 days earlier than they have in the past. Data from a range of species can be combined to cre create something called a spring index or seasonal index. So this is uh, from the UK Phenology Network and what they've done here is combine data from two birds, a butterfly and also a plant to essentially calculate the start of spring. Now the original part of the data set up until the 1940s was collected by the Royal Meteorological Society. There was then a break and then 
More recently, with nature's calendar in the United Kingdom, volunteers have been collecting data on the same species. And you can see that there is a bit of a step change between the start of spring happening earlier than it has in the past. And this is the direction we would like to take with Climate Watch. So as we start to build up more data, we can pick the most recorded species that have got significant uh, data about the seasonal events, combine them to produce a spring index, and we can start to report on the timing of the seasons in Australia. In addition to contributing to phenology research, the data you can collect can be used in a variety of other ways. So you can record as an individual, but you can also record as a group. And it doesn't matter if the same people are recording on the same observations. It just helps to build confidence in that data. But the data you collect will feed into the Climate Watch database. And as we start to validate it and test it against historic data and uh, seasonal expectations, the validated data will feed into the Atlas of Living Australia, which is a national project archiving biodiversity data from a range of different sources. So it's including citizen science data, data from museums, from herbaria, and from a range of research projects. So the Atlas of Living Australia provides a one-stop location if you want to know about data in your area or all of the aggregated data on a particular species. So to finish up, the key thing is to register and start recording at climatewatch.org.au. My email address is there if you want to contact me. Alternatively, please hit the contact us link on the Climate Watch website. Uh, we can respond and help you with any problems, but also answer any questions that you might have about the program. So thanks and please continue recording for Climate Watch.